Well, welcome to our midweek study. We are continuing uh, our quest for wisdom series and starting into a new book today in our study, the book of Proverbs. And uh, we're in the process of sending you out an email if we have your address. Uh, if we don't have your email address, please send it to us And if you want to receive that. But there's a little introductory sheet outline of the book of Proverbs, uh, some of which we'll be going over in the, the session, but it can sort of be an additional help to you in our study. Hope you're having a good week, and I uh, hope this study is a benefit to you as we open this very interesting book, very different from the last one that, that we spent time in, um, Job. Uh, both of them books of wisdom, but uh, different kinds of books. And of sessions we when we sort of did an overview of the wisdom books we talked about um, how they each handle their approach to the search for truth and wisdom differently uh, job is sort of a story of a man who has this great adventure he may not have described it that way but he he goes on this adventure with god and he comes out with a different view of god uh, Proverbs, on the other hand, deals with uh, the search very optimistically. Uh, it, it says that wisdom and truth can be uh, discovered and stated very clearly uh, and very concisely. And so it makes bold statements about what is right and what is wrong, what's true and what's not. And we'll see that, and it's important to, to uh, understand that as you interpret and read these Proverbs, uh, because not understanding that can lead us to confusion and disappointment even in, in what we read. So um, we'll take some time, obviously not going through all the hundreds and hundreds of Proverbs contained within the book of Proverbs, but uh, surveying through, giving you a good introduction, that kind of thing so you can read it more profitably. Uh, let's start out just talking a little bit about what are the Proverbs. Uh, the book itself is sort of an anthology, an anthology of wisdom. Uh, you might remember uh, when you were in school, uh, a lot of times in English literature classes, you'd have those big, thick books, anthologies of English literature uh, that would just have a lot of different authors and different kinds of of English literature, um, just collections of, of different writers, poets, and so forth. Similar kind of thing in Proverbs. It's an anthology, a collection of wisdom by different people and on different themes. Uh, another way to think of them are as spiritual or moral sound bites. Uh, we're, we're familiar with the term sound bites. In our culture, and that's sort of what proverbs are. They're they're brief usually, and have that soundbite aspect to them. They are thoroughly theological. That is, they're written with the idea that there is a God, and and uh, He has expressed His will and that kind of thing. Uh, they are not secular. In fact, <clears throat> it's not possible in the ancient world to, to have a, a secular or an atheistic approach to things. There was no such thing. Everybody believed in a God or more likely many gods. So you could have a pagan approach to wisdom, that is um, believing in many, many different gods and many different expressions of truth and so forth, but not a secular one. So when we read the biblical Proverbs, they are written in light of the fact of a belief in a creator God. Um, again, most all the Proverbs are very brief, quick statements, uh, to the point statements. They don't hem-haw around. Uh, they get to the point. And in fact, they're even briefer than they appear when we read them in English. So if you read them in the original language, uh, they're even shorter 
And so we often have to add some English words to make sure we're getting the uh, expression in the original, just pointing out the fact that they're intended to be brief, to the point, memorable. They don't waste any words. They're sort of, uh, if you're a fan of boxing, uh, like the quick jab kind of thing, that's what proverbs are, a quick statement of some kind of truth or principle. And uh, really designed to be easily remembered, easily memorized, so you can recall them when you need them. And um, in, in, an, in a culture where, you know, a lot of learning was by the ear, uh, a lot of people weren't literate. And so um, they had to be able to memorize what they heard, and these were easy to memorize and should have been easy to recall. Uh, they will state a general truth uh, and um, one of the problems that the people run into with proverbs is they read them sometimes as if they they are a law uh, they read them like they might read something in the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy uh, and we should not do that uh, hardly ever with Proverbs. Proverbs are not to be confused with a law. Uh, as an example of this, uh, one of the favorites that I always point out is over in the 26th chapter of Proverbs. And uh, it just so happens that these two Proverbs are back to back. Uh, and listen to these in light of what we just said, that they're not intended to be a universal law. Proverbs 26 verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. So Proverbs 26 4 says, Answer not, do not answer a fool. Okay? The very next proverb, verse 5, says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. So verse 4 says, don't answer a fool. Verse 5 says, answer a fool. You see how they're not 100% laws. They're not intended to be laws. They're general statements of truth and confident statements of truth. Um, and they're also, we shouldn't think of them in terms of promises most of the time like we do sometimes uh, with, with certain verses of Scripture. Uh, that is a promise of God that always, always will come true. Uh, an example here is a famous proverb, Proverbs 22, verse 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That is a general statement of truth. It is not a law, and it is not an ironclad promise of God that if you train your children well, they will never depart from the training you've given them. That is, they'll always turn out right. Uh, that proverb could be used to shame parents who have had children that, that uh, grew up and went their own way, and uh, like the, the prodigal son, for instance, in the New Testament, and almost like Job's friends. You remember Job's friends come to him and say, Job, all these awful things have happened to you. You must have sinned. You must have messed up. Well, no, they were wrong about that. Also, you could do that with a, a proverb like this. If you didn't understand it correctly, you could say, oh, your child didn't turn out well. They left their faith. They left God. You must have messed up in raising them. Not necessarily. Could that be true? Yes, it could be, but not necessarily. Proverbs 22.6 is not a, an ironclad promise uh, that never uh, fails. Sometimes a parent can be a good parent and raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as Scripture says. Um, and when, when they're older and have are making all their own decisions, they can depart from that training. We need to keep that in mind as we interpret these, um, what, what the Proverbs are and what they aren't. 
Uh, the Proverbs are not covenant promises. Uh, they're general principles from God. And, and really to, to read and study from the Proverbs and to profit from them, you have to sort of ignore for the moment the obvious exceptions to them. So for instance, the one we just read, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. When you study that proverb, you ought to talk about how important it is to raise your children correctly and so forth, and probably shouldn't spend all your time listing all the exceptions to that rule, uh, because it's assumed in, in the, the proverbial wisdom literature that these aren't covenant promises. Um, they're confident statements of general truths. Um, it, it isn't profitable to study them skeptically. Okay? Uh, they are written uh, confidently, optimistically, and we ought to read them that way, but understand what they are. Uh, so uh, important things to keep in mind as you study the the Proverbs. Uh, the word proverb itself comes from the idea of a parallel or a similar thing. So you're drawing parallels, uh, you're comparing things and, and describing truth in that way. Uh, in the New Testament, we call them parables. Uh, that, that's a very similar thing you, you, that Jesus did in his teaching. He did, did it more in story form rather than statement form. Uh, but Proverbs describe truth by way of comparison a lot of times, makes a parallel, we might say an illustration, uh, but in a short, concise way rather than telling a story. Uh, Proverbs are very practical. So you're talking about everyday life kind of things. Um, you don't have a lot of big picture salvation issues discussed in the book of Proverbs. It's more about day-to-day -day living. And so, for instance, in Proverbs, you're not going to see a lot of reference to sin. In fact, in all the wisdom literature, there's not going to be a lot of use of that word, the word sin, like we might see in the New Testament uh, for instance, in a book like Romans, there's a lot of discussion of, of sin and what that is. The parallel in Proverbs to sin is foolishness. You'll hear a lot about foolishness. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, it's a sin to say there's no God, all right? But it doesn't state it that way normally in proverbial wisdom. Uh, uh, what it talks about instead is foolishness and that kind of thing. And so uh, uh, keep that in mind. And also, you know, another aspect of Proverbs is that you can really learn sort of from the mistakes of others. Um, that's the way Proverbs are composed and written. You sort of uh, observe life and say, uh, notice what this person does and, and the bad result in their life from it. And hopefully you can avoid that kind of, of mistake or that kind of foolishness. And as you read through, you'll see lots of examples of that, that perspective. As we said, when we uh, first introduced the wisdom books, um, Solomon is associated with a lot of the wisdom books. He's associated and, and sort of described as the primary source of Proverbs. Uh, Think of King David in relationship to many of the Psalms. Uh, with the Proverbs, you think of Solomon. So, again, the text we read uh, several sessions ago was 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 through 34, where it said that Solomon had composed 3,000 or more than 3,000 Proverbs. There aren't that many Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. There are a little over 900 uh, but, but many of them are associated with Solomon. He's considered the, the fountain of wisdom despite the way he conducts at least the, the latter part of his life, um, which is a, a sad, sad ending to his, to his life. 
The book is organized, um, again, by sort of collections. So there are several collections of Proverbs. We also see this in Psalms. There's different books of the Psalms, five books of the Psalms. Uh, but in Proverbs, we might say there are collections. So, uh, and this is on the sheet that, that we're sending out by email. The first collection runs chapters 1 through 24. Uh, that begins chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. And then for the first 24 chapters, uh, that is Solomon's collection. Then starting at chapter 25 and going through chapter 29, it says there, these also, uh, quoting chapter 25, verse 1, these also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So uh, a, a new collection of Solomonic Proverbs, beginning at chapter 25, verse 1, that Hezekiah's men had something to do with uh, copying, reproducing, providing in chapters 25 through 29. We don't know the background of all that. It's just a notation made there in 25 verse 1. Then chapter 30 of Proverbs, you have a new author. Uh, it says in chapter 30 verse 1, these are the words of Agur, son of Jaka. We don't know anything about him other than he's credited with chapter 30 of Proverbs. And then chapter 31, the final chapter of the book, uh, begins this way. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. We don't know who King Lem Lemuel was. Uh, there's no Israelite or Judean King Lemuel. Uh, we don't know if this is a pseudonym or if it's from some other uh, people group outside of Israel, what it was, but it, that's the way Proverbs 31.1 begins. And of course we have the famous text about the worthy woman in chapter 31 that's a part of this. So that's the basic four collections uh, that make up the, uh, the book of Proverbs. And uh, and I thought we might take a moment and just look at the beginning because um, we have sort of a prologue that begins the book of Proverbs. Um, we already quoted the, the first verse, the, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. But verses 1 through 7 um, really give an introduction, let's say, to the entire collection and I think it's intended for the entire book, not just this first section. So uh, here's what it says. Proverbs 1, beginning verse 2. And, and the way it's expressed, it's sort of explaining what this is all about. What's this book about? What is the purpose? It says, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight to receive instruction in wise de dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then a really important verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the introduction, the prologue to, to the book of Proverbs. And there's a lot in there that's important to think about as we open up the book. Um, again, serves as an introduction. Gives us an idea of the purpose, what what um, those who compiled it wanted to accomplish by doing so. Um, there's three different audiences alluded to here in, in these first seven verses. If you look at the, the uh, 
the verses we read closely. One is the simple. Did you notice in verse 4, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Remember parallelism. So in that verse you have the word simple and youth um, in parallel. So part of the audience is to whoever these simple or young people are, and those uh, be careful in assuming that those are put nouns. Um, we sometimes use the word simple, saying you're simple as an insult. That's not intended here at all. It's just expressing that part of the audience of the Proverbs are inexperienced people, uh, impressionable people. And it's really more of a positive uh, descriptor um, because it's saying here are people that are open, that are pliable, that can be taught, that can be influenced for good. They're also vulnerable, so there's a danger there. If they're not taught, bad things can happen. So it's really a, a, a positive thing. It's not an insult to call somebody simple in this context or, or young. It's just that they are um, they're at a stage where they haven't experienced a lot of life and they need instruction and uh, they are open to it. Um, we all have experience with very young people and, and one of the things we love is their eagerness to learn and their openness. Uh, one of the discouragements sometimes about older people is that we're set in our ways and we're not so eager to change our mind or to be taught, but not so with the young. So a big audience of the Proverbs are the simple or the youth. A second audience addressed here at the open are the wise. Verse 5, let the wise hear, and the one who understands obtain guidance. So you have uh, the audience of, of the wise person or the one who understands. Uh, these are people, they may not be young and inexperienced, but they're still open um, to, to teaching. They are continuing to grow and learn. They may be quite old, but they're still open, you see. Uh, that's a wise person. That is one who understands. And uh, that's, you know, once you get past the, the stage of youth and inexperience and, and your simple stage, um, you really want to stay in that wise stage. That... Uh, pliable heart, that one who wants to understand, and the Proverbs are certainly intended for people like that as well. The only negative audience descriptor here in these opening verses um, are the fools. And um, notice they're mentioned in verse 7, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Um, and uh, of course, foolishness or fools are mentioned a lot in the Proverbs and throughout the wisdom books. And again, there can be a misunderstanding about what we mean when we use the word fool. Um, again, we might use it as an insult, and it's certainly not a positive description of someone. But uh, to, to, to describe someone as a fool in the wisdom books is not to say that they're dumb or that they're stupid. It is to say that they're unteachable. They are unwilling to learn. That's what a fool is in, in Scripture and especially in the wisdom books. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. They don't want to hear. They don't want to listen. And, and so they're, they're fools because of that. And they may well be intelligent in worldly ways. They may be smarter than me. They may be smarter than you in the way we think in the world. 
but they also may be very stubborn and unteachable. Um, the fool often lacks character. Um, they often are amoral um, or immoral and just will not listen to, to, to suggestion of any kind of change or adjustment in their life. So uh, that last phrase of those verses we read at the beginning, fools despise wisdom and instruction, really keys you into a lot of what's going to be uh, talked about in the wisdom books. Uh, so, going back to, um, hopefully, maybe you're looking at the handout or one of the sections of the handout when you eventually get it, uh, gives another little helpful outline of the book of Proverbs. And the reason I like that one is it lists how many Proverbs are in each section of the outline. Uh, for instance, uh, it counts six Proverbs in this opening section of seven verses that we read. Uh, it does that throughout. It says that in chapters 1 through 8, there are about 250 Proverbs. Well, you go through all that, count it all up um, in all 31 chapters, and it comes to a total number of Proverbs is approximately 912, uh, depending on how you count them. But somewhere in that neighborhood, over 900 Proverbs. And then if you look at uh, the way authorship is accredited, in, in the book, you'll see that, Pro, that uh, Solomon is credited with over 500 of those 900. About 512 of them are credited to Solomon. And so, uh, you know, about 55, 56% of the Proverbs in the book of, the Pro, book of Proverbs are credited to King Solomon. Just a for you stat nerds out there, interesting uh, numbers. One last thing I wanted us to do in this particular study is just sort of notice some of the major virtues that are promoted throughout the book. So we'll, we'll read uh, one proverb attached with each of these, uh, but understanding that with each one of these, we could list several more that promote this particular virtue or good characteristic, uh, just some of the major virtues promoted in the book of Proverbs. And it gives us sort of a theme of, of what Proverbs is getting at. The first one, first major virtue we can find an example of in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and that's trusting in God, uh, trusting in the Creator. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. And we will see uh, proverb after proverb teaching that idea of trusting in the Lord and letting him be uh, the guide of our life. Uh, so trust in God is certainly a major virtue promoted in the book of Proverbs. Another one, and we'll sort of jump back and forth in the text itself here as we look down through these. Another one is, uh, an example is chapter 10, verse 1, and, and the virtue is attention to parental wisdom. Paying attention to what your mom and dad says is basically the idea. Pro Proverbs 10, verse 1, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. And uh, again, we can make a long list, maybe the longest list of, of individual proverbs that, that teach the idea of listening to good parents. And uh, whether it's the father sometimes, or even the mother, um, or both, um, attention to parental wisdom is a virtue promoted in the book of Proverbs. The third one is fidelity, or we might say faithfulness. Chapter 6 of Proverbs and verse 32 um, says this, He who commits adultery lacks sense, 
He who does it destroys himself. And so particularly in the context of marriage here in this proverb, um, you know, speaking against adultery, and you think about this, uh, one of the Ten Commandments is you shall not commit adultery. That's a law, right? But it's also that same idea is promoted in the Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, it says it in a different way. It doesn't state it as a law. It just says the person who commits adultery um, is foolish, makes no sense. And so there is a lot in the book um, talking about the importance of faithfulness. Sometimes it's faithfulness to a friend or to a brother. Um, often it's faithfulness to a spouse. Uh, there are long sections uh, where the young person is warned about the dangers of adultery and, and, uh, and unfaithfulness. And we'll, we'll note those in future session. But fidelity or faithfulness, very important virtue in the book. Uh, the fourth one is uh, the idea or the virtue of straightforwardness. Straightforwardness. Chapter 10, verse 10. I like the way this is stated. It says, Whoever winks the eye causes trouble, and a babbling fool will come to ruin. Uh, I think the idea here, you know, the one who winks the eye. What's what's what's, what's the idea there? That is, you say something and you sort of wink, wink, you know, implying that uh, the person you're speaking to under, is to understand you didn't really mean it. And that is a no-no in the wisdom literature. Um, remember the nature of, of, of the Proverbs is to state a truth boldly and confidently. Don't mess around. Don't play around the edges. Don't list all the exceptions that kind of thing, and, and say what you mean. And that virtue is promoted uh, throughout the book of Proverbs. Don't say something and, you know, cross your fingers behind your back or wink your eye. Um, if, if it's not worth saying, don't say it. Straightforwardness is promoted. Another important virtue is discipline. Chapter 12, verse 1. You have the statement, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. And remember, knowledge is always in parallel with wisdom. So whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Uh, the, the virtue of discipline, of it's a, remember, the wise person is willing to accept teaching and instruction. They're open, they're pliable. Um, they can be taught uh, the fool hates discipline and being told what they need to do or how they need to act. And so discipline is promoted as a virtue throughout the book. Just looking, you know, at one example of each of these. Another important one is, it's the sixth one in our list, but it's the uh, virtue of friendship. Uh, chapter 18 and verse 24. Uh, it says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, the second half of that verse may sound um, very familiar to you. It's one that's been quoted a lot through the years. There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And the, the idea of, of true friends is promoted uh, in many Proverbs. And this is one of those where that idea is, is expressed. Uh, the seventh one, and we've got a list here of nine, so we're almost done. The seventh one is one that has frankly fallen out of favor in our time, even among believers, which troubles me. But it's the virtue of sobriety. Chapter 20, verse 1 of Proverbs says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, 
and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Again, sort of a, a colorful way of expressing the truth of the dangers of strong drink, of wine and, and, and stronger drink. Um, and there is a lot in the book of Proverbs, especially about this issue. Uh, some longer sections of Proverbs are devoted to it. We'll, we'll note those in a future session. As I say, it seems, as, as I sort of observe our culture, and I mean, it's always been this way in the, in the worldly culture, but as I observe Christian culture these days, uh, I don't see a lot of teaching of the idea that it is a virtue to be sober. That it is a virtue to avoid strong drink and such things. It's all, almost like it's sort of cool to indulge in such things when we don't really need to. I think the teachings of the book of Proverbs need to be consulted once again. Are we open to those teachings? Are we able to be taught once again in these things? Sobriety is an issue in Proverbs. It's an issue in our society. Uh, number eight is diligence, hard work, a virtue of hard work or diligence. There's a great little section in chapter six, and I just want to, to read through it quickly. Maybe you've heard this one before, but it uses, uh, it's a, a little bit longer than just one verse, but it uses an illustration from nature to teach the, the importance of hard work and diligence. So the illustration is the ant. Proverbs chapter six, verse six, go to the ant, O sluggard. Uh, one of the characters that, that uh, appears sometimes in Proverbs is the sluggard. That is a way of saying a, a, the lazy person. All right, but I guess sluggard sounds more po poetic. So it says, go to the ant, O oh, sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O oh, sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So it uses the picture of the ant, but it's really talking to the lazy person, the person who won't get out of bed, who uh, doesn't work and, and that kind of thing and, and promotes the virtue of hard work uh, and, uh, and classifies you know, the sluggard or the lazy person as, as, as foolish and and not open to the teaching that is offered by wisdom. The last one, uh, number nine, and these aren't obviously all the virtues promoted in the book, but um, some of the major ones. Let me get to it here. I turn clear to Ecclesiastes. That's for future reference. Chapter 28, verse 6. Chapter 28, verse 6. Simplicity. The virtue of simplicity, and not simplicity in the sense of the simple person that was addressed earlier as one of the audiences, uh, the, the the inexperienced, the young. That's not the the simple here. This is a, a virtue, a, a way of living uh, with simplicity. Chapter twenty eight, verse six. Uh, Better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Um, you might remember when we started into the wisdom books, we talked about some of the different kinds of sayings that are found, and this is one of those better sayings. This is better than that. So a comparison is made and it says this is better than that. What's better? It's better to be poor and have integrity than to be rich and be crooked. And it's a simple lifestyle is promoted 
in the book. And there are several really fascinating proverbs that, that do this. This is the kind of lifestyle that Jesus preaches as well um, in, in places like the Sermon on the Mount and others. He promotes and, and, and sings the virtues of the simple life um, and says things like it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom, right? Why is that? Because, because he's so distracted by his, his wealth and it has twisted him and things like that. Well, simplicity is promoted throughout the wisdom books and especially in the book of Proverbs. And we may look at some other examples of that. Um, so that's sort of uh, a quick overview and sampling of the book, a little bit of a look at its structure. And uh, next time what we'll do is take a little bit closer look at a few of, of the Proverbs. We will survey some favorites and that kind of thing. Uh, there are so many that everybody has their own favorite, um, but it is a wide ranging kind of literature. Um, deals with every aspect, nook and cranny of life and, and can benefit us widely because of that. So I hope uh, that you really benefit from from this look in your own study and reflection on the Proverbs. I know a lot of people uh, maybe try and read a few or maybe just one proverb a day. And what a great thing to do. I mean, they are brief, so you can read quickly and then spend time reflecting on them and, and seeing how they apply to your life. And I would suggest you do that. Uh, but hopefully we're preparing you to do that um, more effectively by by showing you principles of understanding of these books. Again, thank you for checking this, this session out, and uh, we will do this again uh, next week if the Lord allows us to. Hope you have a great day and a great rest of the week in your quest for God's wisdom. And may God bless us in that. We'll see you next time.